Um, okay, so since you'll be advancing my slides, I'll ask you to go ahead and put up the first one. There we go. All right. And um, are you able to make your um, your your view full screen, Dahlia? So we can see the slide a little more closely because some of the slides do have text on them. Yes, I'm trying to do that. <laughs> okay. Um... Let's see. There you go. Great. Okay. So, um, so welcome everybody. I'm so happy that you're here for this talk today on preventing falls. Um, I put my contact information in the chat box. So you're welcome to reach out to me individually if we don't have time to answer your specific question today. I wanna thank the Caregiver Coalition and uh, the County of San Diego for inviting me to present on this topic. Um, the, the target audience here is caregivers, those who ca are caring for a client, or a family member or a loved one who is falling, but just for purposes of um, the time frame that we have, when I say you, I will be referring to the individual who is having falls or afraid of falling. So in terms of terminology, I will be addressing the faller, but I understand the audience today is the caregiver audience. So um, with that in mind, I wanna make sure you all know about the San Diego County Fall Prevention Task Force. This is a partnership between the Public Health uh, of San Diego County, hosted through the Health and Human Services Agency, uh, Aging and Independent Services, and also private businesses and private clinicians in San Diego who are interested. We all share the same mission here, which shows on this slide, which is to reduce falls and their devastating consequences in San Diego County. So it's really a unique partnership between private business and public service in order to accomplish this goal. And if you want to learn more about uh, what we're doing, you can always check out our website, San Diego Fall Prevention.org. Um, go ahead, Dahlia. So the next slide, please. So we're going to start off going over some myths about falls. So we have, there's a lot, of course, there's a lot of rumors going around about falls and, and aging, and, and there's a lot of so-called myths, but we're going to just start with three of them today. And I hope that by addressing these three myths, this gives you some hope in terms of the aging experience. The first myth is that muscles and flexibility cannot be regained. And while it's true that normal aging of muscles results in loss of strength and loss of muscle mass, they can be regained through exercise. The second myth is that if somebody stays home, they can prevent falling. And we know that's a myth because when we analyze the data from all the trauma centers in San Diego County regarding falls, we know that most falls occur by slipping and tripping on a level surface in your own home. So that's therefore a myth that if you stay home, you'll prevent falling. The third myth is that falls are a normal part of aging. And that's not true because there are certainly plenty of people that are older and they're not falling. So there are certain risk factors that predispose people to a higher likelihood of falling. And that's what we're gonna address today. And Dahlia? Thank you. So right now the statistics are that about one in four older adults are reporting a fall once a year. And if someone has fallen, they're at a higher risk of falling again. In fact, it's estimated that about 50% of people who have fallen will fall again within six months. And of those who fall, about 20 to 30% will sustain moderate to severe injuries that will prevent them from ever returning home or living alone again. And of course, even the ones who don't have those type of severe injuries that result in a loss of independence, you still can end up with scraped skin, bruised knees, you know, skin your knee, skin your elbow, and things like that, a bump or a bruise or a scrape. And those are really painful. So of course, we don't even want the minor injuries um, even if they don't require emergency care, we want to avoid falls, if, if at all possible. 
So we're going to take you through four actions that you can take to prevent falls. And here they are. The first one is speak up. The second one is keep moving. The third one is check your eyes. And the fourth one is make your home safer. And one thing I want to mention here that was found by a doctor uh, when she studied reducing the risk of falling, what she found was that the more risk factors you address, it has an exponential impact on reducing the risk of falling. So say you only address one of these items, well, that'll reduce the risk of falling a certain amount. But say you address two or three, then the risk of falling is reduced exponentially. And that's because a lot of things we're gonna talk about, as you will see, are interconnected. So the first thing regarding speaking up, the problem that, that causes falls for a lot of older people are chronic conditions and medications. Now, some examples of chronic conditions that can cause falls include things like diabetes, high blood pressure, atrial fibrillation, um, Parkinson's disease, for example, arthritis, um, and things like that. So these are all types of conditions that can cause falls. And then certain medications can cause falls because they may have a side effect of dizziness or muscle weakness or blurry vision and things like that. So now we're gonna talk about the solution. Go ahead, Dahlia. Dahlia, go ahead and advance the slide, please. I did. Oh, okay. On my end, it still says problem, chronic conditions. It says solutions pick up. Yes, you got it. That's what it should be. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not seeing that on my end, but I'll go ahead and keep going. So the solution to dealing with the chronic conditions and the medications is to speak up. And what that specifically means is um, when you're working with your primary doctor. So whether you see a physician, a, a medical doctor, or a, a DO, oh, there it is, Dahlia, I see it now, a DO, or a, a physician's assistant, or a nurse practitioner, you know, whoever your primary care provider is that's, that's uh, you know, managing your medical conditions and helping with your medications, this is the person you wanna speak up to. And you wanna make sure that um, they know all the medications you're taking, including things that are prescribed by other providers, because sometimes you can have drug interactions if you have uh, prescriptions from multiple different doctors. And so you wanna make sure your primary care provider knows everything you're taking. That includes pills, eye drops, nasal spray, um, uh, things you inject or inhale or creams that you put on your skin and um, over-the-counter medications and supplements. So you wanna make sure your primary care provider knows everything that you're taking. You can keep a medication list up to date by um, updating it after every doctor's appointment and making changes so you always have an updated list. And then you can speak up and say, you know, what else do I need to do to manage my chronic health conditions? For example, if you have, um, say, high blood pressure, you can ask your doctor, should I be um, checking my blood pressure every day with a, you know, with a, a blood pressure cuff that I can buy at the pharmacy? Should I be, if you have diabetes, should I be testing my blood sugar? You know, so you want to make sure you speak up and you work with your primary care provider to manage your chronic health conditions to keep them as stable as possible and that they know all the medications you're on in case you're having medication side effects, uh, medication interactions or even interactions with alcohol. So sometimes certain medications have what's called a black box warning where they'll say, absolutely do not drink alcohol with this and, and that can contribute to falls. So those are all the things you wanna speak up about to your primary care provider. And Dahlia, there's some more solutions on the next slide. So some other questions that you can ask your healthcare provider uh, are your medications contributing to your falls? Are you having medication side effects or drug interactions? Um, is, are your current health conditions, like your neurological conditions, like for example, Parkinson's, or if you've had a stroke, 
cardiac, mental health, vision, are any of your health conditions increasing your risk of falls? Do you need to be referred to any kind of a specialist? So your primary care provider would be the one to give you referrals to say physical therapy, occupational therapy, maybe uh, certain types of specialists that you would benefit from seeing. Um, <clears throat> should you be taking any nutritional supplements? Sometimes uh, vitamin B, vitamin D, calcium or iron, things like this can help with certain health conditions that may cause muscle weakness or um, increase your fall risk. For example, just to give you a basic example, if you're low in iron or you're low in B12, that can cause anemia, which causes dizziness, and that can contribute to falls. So that's just an example of how certain nutritional supplements may help reduce your fall risk if your doctor thinks that would benefit you. A lot of times this will be recommended based on your lab work if you get blood work done. And then you can ask the doctor what type of exercise is appropriate. Now, sometimes doctors may not know that much about exercise. That's not really their specialty. And in that case, you may want to get a referral to physical therapy because physical therapists are experts in appropriate exercise given your physical and uh, medical condition. The next thing that your doctor may do if, if you report to your primary care doctor annually for a wellness visit, go ahead and advance the slide, please, Dahlia is they may do fall risk assessment on you. And so the things they're gonna be looking at with the fall risk assessment are really three questions. And these three questions are actually required by Medicare now uh, as part of the annual uh, wellness visit. So the questions are, have you fallen in the past year? Do you feel unsteady when you're standing up and walking or do you worry about falling? Do you have fear of falling? And so that's a quick assessment that your primary care provider may do annually when you go in for your wellness exam. And I would encourage you to be honest. A lot of times people are um, trying to hide if, they, if they're falling or if they're afraid of falling, they try to keep it a secret. And that's really not, not helpful because um, then you won't get the help that you need. So be honest when your provider screens you with these quick risk assessment questions. Okay, the next problem that people have that predisposes them to falls during their retirement is physical inactivity. Have you advanced the slide, Dahlia? Yes, yes. Okay, oh, there it is, great, thank you. Okay, so physical inactivity and fear of falling are two problems that people also have as they get older. And so now we're gonna talk about some of the solutions. So, so one of the myths I think about retirement is people think once they retire, they're gonna to get to relax. And that's sort of a myth because although you won't be working at a full-time job with an employer, your full-time job now is maintaining your mobility and your balance through exercise and maintaining your muscle strength. So it is, work in retirement to maintain your fitness level because you have to combat normal aging of the muscles and loss of strength that's normal with aging. And so um, what I always suggest to people in retirement is go ahead and make your schedule now around your exercise program, whether that's a group class, an online class, or in uh, individual training or physical therapy, whatever you're doing for exercise, make that the foundation of your schedule in retirement or else you may end up making doctor's appointments the foundation of your schedule if you lose your, your fitness and your health. And one of the ways people do that is through physical inactivity. So now we're gonna talk about ways that you, strategies you can use to stay active in addition, of course, to scheduling your physical fitness in your schedule. Um, what, the first one is to keep moving. So there's different ways to keep moving. I know in San Diego, we do have Tai Chi classes and we have feeling fit classes that are um, paid for by the county. Unfortunately, because of the COVID pandemic, those live classes are on hold right now, but we do still have the feeling fit club, which is on television Monday through Friday at 8 a.m., 1 p.m. and 4 p.m. It's on a bunch of different channels on different um, satellite and cable services. And you can also contact the county to get the Feeling Fit Club program on DVD. 
if you want to play it uh, in your DVD player. And I'll give you information at the end on how to contact the county to find out more about the Feeling Fit program. But that's a free exercise program that can be done seated or standing in the comfort of your own home using television or video. Um, and hopefully at some point we'll open up the live sites around the county again. Right For right now, the Tai Chi program is on hold because that was just a live program. Um, and the other thing I want to mention, you see here at the bottom of uh, this slide, the woman is gardening. Uh, when I was doing a talk like this at the Bonita Library a few years ago, a, a woman came up to me afterwards and she said, I clean my house from top to bottom every single day. Does that count as exercise? What do you think? I said, yes, it does. Because if you're not sitting on the couch watching TV, if you're up, you're down, you're sweeping, you're mopping, you're dusting, you're picking things up, walking around. Yes, that counts as physical activity. Now, we want to have a variety of physical activity. We want to have some cardiovascular, some balance, some strengthening, some flexibility and endurance. But overall, just staying active, even if it's gardening or cleaning your house or things like that, that's really good for you to stay fit as you get older and you keep moving, and that will help reduce the risk of falling. Now, if you're not sure how to exercise, the thing you want to do is uh, get a referral to physical therapy because they can get you started. You can get a physical therapist to come to your home, or you can go to a clinic um, to get some professional advice on appropriate exercise for you. Okay, now go ahead and advance, Dahlia. Thank you. That was where I had added some additional slides because that was a lot of information. Okay, now we'll talk about footwear. So making sure you have the right shoes is important to staying active, physically active. Uh, you'll see on the left, there's two pictures of shoes that got a big red X. And those are because those are not recommended. And then on the right, you see a pair of shoes that are good for reducing the risk of falling. Now I'm gonna explain why um, some of the, those two on the left are not good and the one on the right is good. So when we look at footwear to reduce the risk of falling, what we found in the research is that footwear with uh, that securely fastens to your feet and has a thin non-skid sole is the best. So you can see on the on the far side with the green checkbox, that shoe securely fastens onto the foot and it has a thin non-skid sole. If you look on the on the left side of your screen, the high heel obviously uh, it does not have a thin non-skid sole. Those are slippery. And also men's dress shoes that men might wear to a wedding or special event. Those tend to be slick on the bottom also. So men's dress shoes and women's heels are not don't have that um, non-skid sole. Also, women can twist their ankle very easily wearing the high heels because the ankles aren't as strong as they used to be. And then that boot that you see there, the, the sole is too thick. So that will prevent the person wearing that boot from being able to feel the floor. So you have to feel the floor to some extent, the pressure on the floor coming up through the sole of your foot. And that allows you to feel what we call the ground reaction force, which tells you where you are. And if the sole of your shoe is too thick, you won't feel the floor through your shoe, the pressure of the floor, and that will affect your balance. So we wanna select footwear that has a thin non-skid sole and that securely fastens to your feet. And the next problem is vision. So when we look at what's going on with vision, there's a couple things. First of all, we have normal aging of the eyes. So normal aging of the eyes, which is gonna affect everybody, no matter if you have an eye problem or not, you're still gonna, as you get older, your eyes are gonna age. And with normal aging of the eyes, a lot of people need more light to see what they used to be able to see with less light. So you may need to improve the lighting in your house um, they may be more sensitive to glare. You may need to reduce the glare coming in through the windows. Uh, a lot of people need glasses for, for reading uh, just because of normal aging of the eye. And then also uh, in, in older adults, the contrast sensitivity is reduced from normal aging. For example, what that means is if you're walking down a flight of stairs and they're all made out of concrete and it's all gray, then you may not be able to see where the edge of the step is 
and then you can you can miss the step because everything blends in and it's all just sort of a gray scale and the contrast which is the edge of the step is not as easy to see because of normal aging of the eyes so we have a reduced ability to see contrast and even a somewhat reduced ability to see colors things tend to fade into a gray scale and so that's just normal aging of the eye that will affect everybody increasing their risk of falling and then we have um, actual diseases that affect the eyes, which is like uh, cataracts, macular degeneration, glaucoma, and diabetic retinopathy. And, and those eye diseases are more common in people over 65 years old. So you want to, the, the recommendation here um, on the next slide is to get your eyes checked. And uh, the recommendation is to get your eyes checked annually. So that would be an annual eye exam. Make sure you have the proper glasses that you need if you need glasses. And then you're gonna get screened for the eye diseases that I mentioned, glaucoma, macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, and cataracts. And then there, there is some evidence that the first eye cataract surgery reduces the risk of falling. So um, people that get that have cataracts, once they get their first eye surgery uh, completed, that has been shown to reduce the risk of falling. And so if you have diabetes, for example, that has out of control blood sugars, your doctor may suggest for you to get your eyes checked more often, like once every six months, for example. But if, you're, um, if, you're, if your eye health is fairly stable, the recommendation is typically to get an annual eye exam and then to wear the glasses that they give you. And I would also say beware of multifocal lenses like bifocals, trifocals, and progressive lenses. Um, ten, they may cause dizziness. Um, so if you start having a problem with dizziness, once you start wearing bifocals, trifocals, or progressive lenses, that may not be the best choice for you. You may have to go back to one pair of glasses for distance and one pair of glasses for reading. And if you have bifocals, trifocals, and progressive lenses, and you find that you're tripping on curbs, steps, and inclines, then you have to be careful not to look down through the reading lens while you're stepping up on things, which has caused a lot of falls in people I've met, including my very own grandmother who fell at the curb walking up to a shopping center and skinned her elbows, which was extremely painful for her when she got a new pair of bifocals. She just missed the step. She didn't, she couldn't tell how far the curb was. She missed it. And then she slid out onto the sidewalk and skinned her elbows, not to mention it was very embarrassing for her. So with the bifocals, the trifocals and progressive lenses, even if they don't make you dizzy, um, then they may be fine and okay for you if they're not making you dizzy, but you still have to be careful on curb steps and inclines that you don't trip or miss the step. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So the fourth um, area of, uh, topic that we're going to cover today is regarding the environmental hazards that contribute to falls. One of the things that happens when people get older is they tend to downsize from their primary house into a smaller, more manageable living space, like an apartment or an assisted living or a condo maybe. And then what happens is they don't want to get rid of all their stuff. And so people tend to clutter up their environment with all their stuff, furniture, you know, all that stuff in a smaller space as they get older. So one thing, or, or you know, just um, if people also start having health problems, it's harder to maintain their home. So even if they haven't moved and downsized, maybe things are just piling up that need to be uh, organized or thrown out. And so um, one of the problems is just clutter, just too much stuff, in too small of a space. And, and that's that definitely can contribute to falls, especially for people that walk with a walker. If you have to turn sideways and shimmy between furniture or between piles on the floor with your walker, that's definitely not safe. So you wanna make sure that all the walkways in your house are wide enough to use your walker if you have one, and that there's nothing um, uh, blocking the walkway and nothing going across the walkway, like electrical cords and rugs and things that might cause you to trip. Because um, of course, with that change we talked about with the vision and the reduction in contrast sensitivity, meaning you can't see the edges of lines of things, 
you may not detect where the floor changes to a rug or where there's a cord across the floor. That may not be as visually obvious anymore. And so you wanna avoid having things like that in the walkway and just make sure the walkway is open and wide enough for you to get through. Um, and then the lighting, we already mentioned that in the vision section, but you may have to add more lighting to your home, uh, like at the top of the stairs, the bottom of the stairs and things like that, so that you have good enough lighting now that your eyes have changed and you need more light uh, than you used to due to normal aging of the eyes. You may have to increase the lighting in your home. And then of course, uh, on this picture, it shows an example of a slippery surface we do know that um, most falls are happening in the bathroom of the person's home. And of course, that's because the floor's wet and you're wet and everything is slippery. So, um, so just be careful with the wet floors that they can predispose you to falls. Um, and go ahead and hit the advanced button again, Dahlia, so that home safety checklist flies up. There we go. Okay, so we have something for the fall prevention task force which is um, what we call this home safety checklist here. And this is just a snapshot of it, but we would like to, um, in fact, Dahlia, I have this electronically. I can send it to you um, after the talk and then you can send it out to all the participants. Um, so this is the home safety checklist uh, we have available for you digitally. And basically what we did, what we did here through the fall prevention task force is we put together what you wanna look for in every room of your house. So what about the kitchen? What about the bathroom, the bedroom? What about outside? We talk about telephones, lighting, uh, stairs and steps and floors. So there's different areas. And what we would encourage you to do is, is take this and kind of go through your house and say, what changes do I need to make to make this uh, more safe and reduce my risk of falling? And this actually may be an area where you can engage a friend, a family member, or a neighbor. If somebody has said to you, hey, you know what? I wanna help you, what can I do? Um, this would be something you can say, you know what? Come over and let's go through the home safety checklist together and figure out any changes we need to make. And then if you have to go buy something, for example, you need to go buy a nightlight or something like that, they can maybe run out and get that for you. So if someone's been offering to help you because they know you've fallen or you're afraid of falling and you didn't know what to ask them to help with, my suggestion is you invite them over to go over the home safety checklist with you and help you. In fact, a lot of the modifications that are uh, suggested are not too expensive to make. Let's take a look at the next slide. We'll see some examples here of some of the modifications that people might use. So grab bars, first and foremost in the, in the bathroom are awesome because of the risk of falling with the slippery surface in the shower and on the floor. Um, grab bars you can have installed by a handyman or a friend if they can get them at say Home Depot. Uh, they even have decorative grab bars that look like uh, towel racks. So no one will even know it's a grab bar, but you will. And the difference between a towel rack and a grab bar is that towel racks will fall right out of the wall if you put any weight on it, because they're just in with little tiny nails, okay? But a grab bar is actually gonna be screwed into the studs in your wall with long screws. And so it is intended for weight bearing. And that's the difference. That's why you don't wanna grab on a, a towel rack or even the handle of your shower door. If you have a glass uh, shower door, a lot of people will hold on to that. We don't wanna do that because those will fall off or break whereas the grab bars are designed to support your weight because they're nailed into the studs and they have long screws. So putting in grab bars is one of the most simple uh, modifications you can make in your home to reduce the risk of falling. Um, you can also, uh, San Diego Fall Prevention Task Force, we work with a number of um, community organizations that have free grab bar installation. If you can't afford to pay for it yourself, um, you can look, uh, you can contact us at the information I'll provide at the end, and they have um, a few programs that do free grab bars throughout the county. They do typically have a waiting list. I'll just let you know about that. Um, the other thing you could do is uh, you could sit down in the shower. So you see on the bottom left corner here, a tub bench. They do have also shower chairs, which are smaller, just like a little stool to sit on. So you could sit on a tub bench, you could sit on a shower chair, and that will reduce your risk of falling in the shower. 
And then if you do sit down in the shower, you have to get a um, handheld shower hose, which is shown up in the upper right corner there so that you can rinse yourself off. Um, the other couple things on here are a walker, of course, walkers, canes, and other assistive devices will reduce the risk of falling if you're doing what we call furniture walking. So you're walking around your house, holding on to everything you can, grabbing the shelf, grabbing the back of your chair, grabbing the table, grabbing the dresser. You're just sort of swinging from furniture to furniture, holding on, and you're doing what we call furniture walking, then you may need an assistive device like a walker or a cane. And if you're not sure about which one is best for you, that would be a good reason to go to physical therapy because we do recommend assistive devices and fit them and train you how to use them properly. Um, and then, of course, the bottom right corner here, this emergency alert system, there's a number of different products out there that offer emergency alerts. And this is important if someone is going to be home alone um, and without someone checking on them regularly, that they would have a way to call for help um, because sometimes people do fall and they can't get up and then they're on the ground for hours or days before anyone finds them on the ground. So they have ones now with uh, GPS trackers that can follow you even if you leave your house to go for a walk. They have ones now that can detect if you've fallen and activate the emergency response system. So there's different brands and different products. These usually run about $50 a month on average for the cost of that emergency help button. And then there, there's another example on here, which is a grabber, of course, grabbers. And uh, there's all kinds of different tools that you may get from uh, an occupational therapist or a physical therapist. But those tools are fairly inexpensive. There's, there's a lot of inexpensive things you can add to your house to make it safe. It doesn't have to be a huge home remodel. Just a few changes can help can help reduce your risk of falling in your environment. The next thing I want to mention to you is our community programs, <clears throat> healthierlivingsd.org. We have um, different programs in the community. We have, for example, healthier living with chronic pain, healthier living with diabetes, healthier living with chronic health conditions. Um, those are all educational programs to teach you how to manage your chronic health conditions. Right now, as far as I've heard, those are those are on hold due to the pandemic, but they are working towards um, launching them online, online programs, because those have been in-person training programs, and those are evidence-based programs. So I'm going to, um, you can look at healthierlivingsd.org to see what they have. Uh, those are the free evidence-based programs offered by the county that have to do with exercise and health management, which are related to reducing the risk of falling. And then I'll also send uh, Dahlia some information to email out to everyone that joined us today with the electronic copies uh, related to the community programs and the home safety checklist. So just to review on the next slide, the, the review is uh, four actions you can take to prevent falls. Now, I did give you a lot more helpful tips than just the four actions because each area kind of added some helpful tips in there. But the main four actions we're advocating to reduce the risk of falling are speak up with regards to managing your chronic health conditions and your medications uh, with your primary care provider. Keep moving through exercise, through daily chores, through gardening, through working with a physical therapist if needed, make sure you have the proper footwear. Get your eyes checked at least once a year and wear your glasses if you need them. Manage your eye diseases if you have any with the help of your doctor and take steps to make your home more safe by using the home safety checklist and maybe um, putting in some grab bars and some things like that that are not too expensive to reduce the risk of falling from your environment. So now we have some time for questions. Um, oh, oh, thank you, Dahlia, and here's the contact information. So if you wanted to find out about, um, uh, if, for example, if you don't receive the home safety checklist from Dahlia, I. I should have probably checked with you before that, Dahlia, but I'm hoping you can send out an email as a follow-up to everybody with that. But this is where you can find out information, healthierlivingsd.hhsa at sdcounty.ca.gov. That's where you can find out information about our free 
uh, health management programs for chronic pain, diabetes, chronic health conditions, and also our exercise classes and programs. You can find out information by emailing, by calling, or by going on our website, sandiegofallprevention.org. Okay, okay. we'll have some time for questions. And I know uh, we went a little bit over, but this is just so, um, you know, how you put this in, a, in less than 40 minutes. There's a lot yeah, of information. And I, and I think we started we started a little bit late. I think I got the I got started about eleven oh seven. So only a few minutes over. Hopefully that's okay with everybody. Yeah. So if you guys have any questions, there's a chat box on the bottom. You can write um, um, a question, and I can read it to Kim. Um, I know there is a comment from Teresa. She said, "Thank you, excellent program offered." So that's. Uh, oh, thank uh, you, Teresa. Um. So. While we're waiting to see if any, uh, I know it takes a moment to um, write the question. And if not, you guys can always send an email to me or to um, Dr. Bell, or we can, uh, I think this is, isn't this the full prevention test? That's the phone number to call. Am I correct, Kim? That is the health promotion team. So I'm I'm okay. looking at um, an email from Carolyn. Uh, she says the healthier living programs, which are the chronic disease, chronic pain, and diabetes, are not available at the moment, as I mentioned, because they were supposed to be in person. But they're in the process of making them available online. And then the Tai Chi classes are not meeting right now, but the Feeling Fit classes, which are the free exercise classes, are still um, operating through home use online through cable TV, or you can get a DVD. Uh, mailed to your home. So I'm going to um, send you, Dahlia, the information. But basically, that phone number right there is how you can contact the health promotion team um, to request your Feeling Fit Club DVD and a stretch band for home use. You'll just call and leave a message asking for the Feeling Fit DVD, or you can email them at that healthierliving.hhsa uh, uh, at sdgov, um, and they will um, mail you a feeling fit DVD. Okay. Um, I have a question. Um, there was a question about Dr. Bell's mailing list. Uh huh. Um, the person said, tell us about Dr. Bell's mailing list. Oh, <laughs> um, okay. So basically, I put that in there just to let people know that I do regularly create free, helpful information for anyone who um, signs up for my mailing list. And I email it out. I email out a minimum of one email per month. And then sometimes I might send out a second email. Um, and basically it's just updates on um, what's going on. Like for example, the, the email I sent out to my mailing list for this month promoted this presentation um, and promoted, I have a presentation I'm doing today at two o'clock on uh, dizziness, foot neuropathy and incontinence, I included that. And uh, just letting people know, you know, what kind of free educational events are coming up that I'm promoting and participating in. And then I do have a blog that I publish. I actually have two blogs, which I publish free articles, one on each blog per month. So that's two free articles per month. And um, the topics are dizziness, vertigo, balance problems, and falls. So uh, it just depends on what I publish that month in terms of content. But I do send out an email uh, letting people know, okay, these articles are now available for you to read. So it would just be if you want to receive free, helpful information for me from me, you can go to my website, betterbalanceinlife.com and join my mailing list. Actually, I had myself muted, so I'm going to say this again. I think these are all the questions for today. Um, I really appreciate this. This was a wonderful presentation. And if um, any of our participants have a question, they can definitely either email me or um, um, uh, just send a, a um, question and we can try to answer the best I can and forward the email to Dr. Bell or yes. the health promotion. Yes, and I'm gonna send you the um, home safety checklist and the Feeling Fit Club information right now so that you can forward it out to everybody on the call. Okay, that sounds wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. Stay safe, take care of yourself, and I will see you soon. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.
拜。